The genitourinary system, or urogenital system, is the organ system of the reproductive organs and the urinary system. These are grouped together because of their proximity to each other, their common embryological origin, and the use of common pathways, like the male urethra. Some of us are not always comfortable discussing injuries of these systems with our patients, and sometimes our patients are not always comfortable talking to us. These can be sensitive injuries and or conditions, so we need to remember that when we are discussing these issues that we need to remain professional at all times. I would encourage you to use the correct medical terminology when referring to parts of the system as well. The urinary system, also known as the renal system or urinary tract, consists of two kidneys that filter into a ureter from each kidney the ureters transport waste to the bladder and then out through the urethra. The purpose of the urinary system is to eliminate waste from the body, regulate blood volume and blood pressure, control levels of electrolytes and metabolites, and to regulate blood pH. The urinary tract is the body's drainage system for eventual removal of urine. The female and male urinary system are very similar differing only in the length of the urethra. Urine is formed in the kidneys through the filtration of blood. The urine is then passed through the ureters to the bladder where it is stored. During urination, the urine is passed from the bladder through the urethra to the outside of the body. The average urine production in an adult human is about one to two liters per day. This is dependent upon the state of hydration, activity level, environmental factors, weight, and the individual's overall health. Producing too much or too little urine requires medical attention. Polyuria is a condition of excessive urine production, greater than 2.5 liters per day. Oglyuria is when less than 400 milliliters are produced, and anuria occurs when less than 100 milliliters per day is produced. The urinary bladder is a muscular sac in the pelvis, just above and behind the pubic bone. When empty, the bladder is about the size and the shape of a pear. The bladder stores urine, allowing urination to be infrequent and controlled. The bladder is lined by layers of muscle tissue that stretch to hold the urine. Normal capacity of the bladder is about 400 to 600 milliliters. During urination, the bladder muscles squeeze and two sphincters, or valves, open to allow urine to flow out. Urine exits the bladder into the urethra, which carries urine out of the body. Because it passes through the penis, the urethra is much longer in men, approximately 8 inches long. This is in contrast to women. In women, the urethra is only about 1.5 inches long. The male reproductive system consists of a number of sex organs that play a role in the process of human reproduction. These organs are located on the outside of the body and within the pelvis. The organs of the male reproductive system are specialized for the following functions. To produce, maintain, and transport sperm, the male reproductive cells, and protective fluid called semen. To discharge of sperm, and to produce and secrete male sex hormones. The male reproductive system includes the penis, scrotum, testes, epididymis, vas deferens, prostate, and seminal vesicles. The penis and the urethra are part of the urinary and reproductive systems. The scrotum, testicles, epididymis, vas deferens, seminal vesicles, and prostate comprise the rest of the reproductive system. The female reproductive system is made up of internal organs and external structures. Its function is to enable reproduction of the species. Sexual maturation is the process that this system undergoes in order to carry out its role in the process of pregnancy and childbirth. The female reproductive system includes internal structures such as ovaries, fallopian tubes, uterus, and the vagina. And then the external genitalia include the mons pubis, labia majora and minora, vestibule of the vagina, bulb of the vestibule, vestibular glands, and the clitoris. 
The menstrual cycle is the monthly cycle of follicle and egg maturation, the release of an egg, ovulation, and preparation of the uterine lining for pregnancy. If a woman does not become pregnant, the uterine lining tissue is shed as menstrual blood. Most menstrual cycles occur every 28 days. Menarche is the time during adolescence when menstrual periods begin. Menstrual periods continue to occur until a woman reaches menopause. The physiology of ovulation and menstruation. There are multiple phases starting with the follicular phase. The follicular phase is at the beginning of the menstrual cycle. It starts on the first day of menstrual bleeding and usually lasts for about 14 days. The hormones called follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone are released from the pituitary to stimulate the ovaries. In turn, the ovaries produce estrogen and stimulate the maturation of about 15 to 20 eggs in the ovaries inside of a small cystic area known as follicles. Once estrogen levels begin to rise, the secretion of follicle stimulating hormone is reduced by a feedback system so that the follicle stimulation ceases at the appropriate time. With time, only one egg follicle, or rarely two or more, become dominant, and maturation of the other follicles is interrupted. The dominant follicle continues to make estrogen. Ovulation is the next stage of the cycle. Ovulation occurs at the midpoint of the menstrual cycle. Estrogen production from the dominant follicle leads to a sharp rise in luteinizing hormone secretion, causing the dominant follicle to release its egg. The egg is then swept down the fallopian tube by a thin structure on the ends of the tube known as fimbrae. At this time, the cervix produces an increased amount of thin mucus that assists sperm into the passage of the uterus. The last phase is the luteal phase. The luteal phase of the menstrual cycle begins at ovulation or egg release. After the egg is released, the empty follicle turns into a cystic mass of cells called the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum then produces progesterone, a hormone that readies the lining of the uterus for implantation of a fertilized egg. If an egg has been fertilized, the fertilized egg travels down one of the fallopian tubes into the uterus and implants in the uterine lining tissue. If fertilization of an egg has not occurred, the lining of the uterus eventually breaks down and is shed, resulting in menstrual bleeding. Menopause is defined at the point in time at which a woman has not had a menstrual period for at least 12 consecutive months. It signals the end of a woman's fertility and occurs on average around 51 years of age, although the time of menopause can vary widely among women. With menopause, hormone levels drop and some women experience unpleasant side effects from the lowering hormone levels, including hot flashes, mood changes, headaches, tiredness, and sleep disturbances. The maternal physiological changes during pregnancy are the adaptations that a woman's body undergoes to accommodate the growing embryo or fetus. These physiological changes are entirely normal and include behavioral, cardiovascular, hematological, metabolic, renal, postural, and respiratory changes. Increases in blood sugar, breathing, and cardiac output are all expected changes that allow a pregnant woman's body to facilitate the proper growth and development of the embryo or fetus during pregnancy. The pregnant woman and the placenta also produce many other hormones that have a broad range of effects during pregnancy. Cardiac output increases during pregnancy as a result in increases in both stroke volume and heart rate. Cardiac output increases throughout early pregnancy and peaks in the third trimester, usually 30 to 50% above baseline. The heart rate also increases, but generally not above 100 beats per minute. The total systematic vascular resistance decreases by 20% secondary to the vasodilatory effect of progesterone. Overall, the systolic and diastolic blood pressure drops 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury in the first trimester 
and then returns to baseline in the second half of pregnancy. All of these cardiovascular adaptations can lead to common complaints, such as palpitations, decreased exercise tolerance, and dizziness. Plasma volume increases with pregnancy. During pregnancy, the plasma volume increases by 40 to 50 percent, and the red blood cell volume increases by 20 to 30 percent. These changes occur mostly in the second trimester and prior to 32 weeks of gestation. The high flow of blood exiting the heart can often create a benign heart murmur. These murmurs are called an innocent heart murmur. They are not associated with medical or heart-related conditions and do not require treatment or lifestyle changes. There's also an increase in tidal volume. There are many physiological changes that occur during pregnancy that influence respiratory status and function. Progesterone has noticeable effects on respiratory physiology, increasing minute volume, or the amount of air that's breathed in and out in the lungs in one minute by 40% in the first trimester, via an increase in tidal volume alone. The respiratory rate does not change during pregnancy, however. The core temperature is higher. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists recommend that pregnant women never let their core body temperature rise above 102.2 degrees Fahrenheit. A pregnant woman's body temperature is often already elevated around 0.4 degrees above the normal 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. As we talk about evaluating the genitourinary and gynecological systems, there are important things to consider. We want to maintain clear and professional demeanor at all times. Use the correct medical and anatomical terms. It is strongly advisable to have a person of the patient's same gender present during history. Ask pertinent questions about signs, symptoms, and the onset. I would also encourage you to only ask the questions that you think are necessary. The goal of our evaluation is to collect enough information to refer the patient to the correct provider. These are a few of the systems in the body that we are probably not going to palpate. We are going to collect a thorough history to determine where we need to send this individual for further treatment. The next part of our slides is going to talk about specific conditions related to gentrourinary and gynecological systems. Kidney stones are the result of buildup of dissolved minerals on the inner lining of the kidneys. These usually consist of calcium oxalate, but may be composed of several other compounds as well. Kidney stones can grow to the size of a golf ball while maintaining sharp crystalline structures. Urine becomes supersaturated with salt that is capable of forming solid crystals. The stones may be small and pass unnoticed through the urinary tract, but they can also cause extreme pain as they leave the body. These stones can also be found in the ureters, urinary bladder, and the urethra. This is an MRI of somebody with kidney stones. We can see the stones by the blue arrow that are sitting in the kidney. These stones are actually rather large. You can see some stones here in the bladder. These stones have moved through the kidney but have not passed out of the body yet. Kidney stones that remain inside the body can also lead to many complications. These include blockage of the tube connecting the kidney to the bladder, which obstructs the path that urine uses to leave the body. People with kidney stones have a significantly higher risk of developing chronic kidney stone disease. This kidney had to be removed from somebody because of chronic kidney stone disease. We can see on dissection of the kidney the many stones that fill the kidney. Some of these are really quite large. The leading cause of kidney stones is a lack of water in the body. Stones are more commonly found in individuals who drink less than the recommended 8 to 10 glasses of water per day. When there is not enough water to dilute the uric acid, a component of urine, the urine becomes more acidic. An excessively acidic environment in urine can lead to formation of kidney stones. Medical conditions such as Crohn's disease, 
urinary tract infections, renal tubular acidosis, hyperparathyroidism, medullary sponge kidney, and dense disease increase the risk of kidney stones. Kidney stones occur more commonly among males than females. Most people who experience kidney stones do so between the ages of 30 and 50 years. A family history of kidney stones also increases one's chances of developing them. Similarly, a previous kidney stone occurrence increases the risk that a person will develop subsequent stones in the future if preventative action is not taken. Treating kidney stones is primarily focused on symptom management. Passing a stone can be extremely painful. If a person has a history of kidney stones, home treatment may be suitable. Individuals who have never passed a kidney stone should speak to a doctor. If hospital treatment is needed, an individual may be rehydrated via intravenous tube. Narcotics are often used in the effort to make the pain of passing the stone more tolerable. Antiemetic medication can be used in people experiencing nausea and vomiting. In some cases, a urologist can perform a shockwave therapy called lithotripsy. This is a treatment that breaks the kidney stone into smaller pieces and allows it to pass through the kidney. People with large stones located in regions that do not allow for lithotripsy may receive surgical procedures, such as the removal of a stone via an incision in the back or by inserting a thin tube into the urethra. Hematuria is one of the most commonly found abnormalities after sport activity. This phenomenon can occur in non-contact sports as well as in contact sports. The pathophysiology can either be traumatic or non-traumatic. Exercise-induced hemoteuria, or sports hemoteuria, is a benign condition in which blood is present in the urine, following exercise. This also has been called runner's bladder, marathon's hemoteuria, and stress hemoteuria. Exercise or sports-induced hemoteuria may have various causes, ranging from relatively harmless ones to more worrisome ones. In general, if the urine clears 72 hours after exercise, then there is no need to further investigate. However, some causes do need to be investigated, particularly if the blood in the urine keeps appearing or does not clear after 72 hours. Sometimes the breakdown of red blood cells and muscles may appear in the urine, making the urine appear much darker, and this may be mistaken for actual blood. Some foods may also color the urine reddish, and some medications, such as blood thinners, may lead to actual blood in the urine. For most cases of exercise-induced hematuria, the causes are related to the intensity and the duration of activity, as well as the hydration status of the individual. Longer and more intense events have been known to be more likely to cause hematuria. In addition to non-contact injury, Direct impact to the kidneys, bladder, or urethra could potentially cause traumatic hematuria as well. Hematuria in itself can be caused by other factors apart from exercise, such as urinary tract infections, the presence of a stone in the urinary tract, and kidney disease. Apart from having blood in the urine, athletes with exercise-induced hematuria usually have no other symptoms. Occasionally, athletes will have pain just above the front region of the hip. If the hematuria is related to direct trauma, then pain at the site of impact is expected. Evaluation of a urine sample is often needed to investigate hematuria. Recommendations for preventing hematuria include staying well hydrated and running with a bladder that is not completely empty. In contact sports, wearing the proper protective equipment is necessary. In cases where there are no symptoms, athletes may return to play if the hematuria has resolved within 72 hours. If not, medical clearance from a healthcare personnel is advised. In cases where trauma is involved, returning to play may take a little longer and will depend upon the severity of the injury. A urinary tract infection, or a UTI, is an infection in any part of your urinary system, including your kidneys, 
ureter, bladder, and urethra. Most infections involve the lower urinary tract, the bladder, and the urethra. Women are at a greater risk of developing a UTI than are men. Infections limited to your bladder can be painful and annoying. However, serious consequences can occur if a UTI spreads to your kidneys. Doctors will typically treat urinary tract infections with antibiotics. Urinary tract infections do not always cause signs and symptoms, but when they do, they may include a strong persistent urge to urinate, a burning sensation when urinating, passing frequent small amounts of urine, urine that appears really cloudy, urine that appears red, bright pink, or cola colored, which may be signs of blood in the urine, strong smelling urine, and pelvic pain, especially in women. We see this most commonly in the center of the pelvis and around the area of the pubic bone. It is common for UTIs to be overlooked or mistaken for other conditions, especially in older adults. Urinary tract infections are common in women, and many women experience more than one infection during their lifetime. Risk factors specific for women for UTIs include the female anatomy. A woman has a shorter urethra than a man does, which shortens the distance that bacteria must travel to reach the bladder. Sexual activity. Sexually active women tend to have more UTIs than do women who are not sexually active. Having a new sexual partner also increases your risk. Certain types of birth control. Women who use diaphragms for birth control may be at a higher risk as well as women who use spermicidal agents. And menopause. After menopause, a decline in circulating estrogen can cause changes in the urinary tract that make you more vulnerable to infection. To prevent a urinary tract infection, drink plenty of liquids, especially water. Drink cranberry juice. Although studies are not conclusive that cranberry juice prevents UTIs, it's likely not harmful. Wipe from front to back. Doing so after urinating or after a bowel movement helps to prevent bacteria in the anal region from spreading into the vagina and the urethra. Empty your bladder soon after intercourse. Avoid potentially irritating feminine products, such as deodorant sprays, other feminine products, or douches or powders. You can also talk to a physician about changing your birth control method. Cystitis is known as a bladder infection, and urethritis is an infection of the urethra. Cystitis and urethritis are lower urinary tract infections. They develop secondary to an infection of the bladder and the urethra, and they may either be complicated or non-complicated. The majority of cases are related to bacterial infections. In cystitis, the colonization of the urinary bladder occurs after organisms from the perineum ascend into the bladder. Failure of adequately emptying the urinary bladder increases the risk of colonization, and organisms will grow and lead to inflammation in the bladder. Urethritis occurs mainly after exposure to a sexually transmitted disease. Less commonly, it can be related to a structural problem with the urethra. Both cystitis and urethritis may present with pain or difficulty on urination, also known as dysuria, frequency and urgency to urinate, and or suprapubic pain or heaviness. A careful history may help differentiate between the two diseases. Sexually transmitted infections, or STIs, are also called sexually transmitted diseases, or STDs. STIs are usually spread by having vaginal, oral, or anal sex. More than 9 million women in the United States are diagnosed with an STI each year. Women often have more serious health problems from STIs than do men, including infertility. Some STIs can be cured, and some STIs cannot be cured. For those STIs that cannot be cured, there are medicines to manage the symptoms. Nearly 20 million people in the United States get an STI each year. These infections affect women and men of all backgrounds and economic levels. Half of all new infections are among people from 15 to 20 years of age. Women often have more serious health problems from STIs than men. 
chlamydia, and gonorrhea left untreated raise the risk of chronic pelvic pain and life-threatening ectopic pregnancy. Chlamydia and gonorrhea can also cause infertility. Untreated syphilis in pregnant women results in infant death up to 40% of the time. Many STIs only have mild symptoms or no symptoms at all. When symptoms do occur, sometimes they are mistaken for something else, such as a urinary tract infection or yeast infection. Some signs and symptoms of STIs include dysuria or painful urination, the urge to void but production of small volume, and urethral discharge, itching, or burning. This table might be helpful in understanding the similarities and differences between some of the commonly transmitted infections, including HPV or genital warts, syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, HIV, and herpes too. Salpingitis is a type of pelvic inflammatory disease, or PID. PID refers to an infection of the reproductive organs in a woman. It develops when harmful bacteria enter the reproductive tract. Salopingitis, among other forms of PID, usually result from sexually transmitted infections that involve bacteria, such as chlamydia or gonorrhea. Salpingitis causes inflammation of the fallopian tubes, and this inflammation can easily spread from one tube to another, so both tubes may become affected. If left untreated, salpingitis can result in long-term complications. Not every woman who gets this condition will experience symptoms, but when symptoms are present, an individual may experience foul-smelling vaginal discharge, yellow vaginal discharge, pain during ovulation, menstruation, or sex, spotting between periods, dull lower back pain, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, fever, and frequent urination. This condition can be acute or chronic, Sometimes symptoms may go away without any treatment, giving the individual a false impression that the underlying infection is no longer there. If the infection is not treated, it can result in long-term complications. These long-term complications may be the spread of infection to other areas of the body, including the uterus and ovaries, long-term pelvic and abdominal pain, tubal scarring, adhesions, and blockages, which can lead to infertility, abscesses in the fallopian tubes, and ectopic pregnancy. Testicular torsion is an emergency condition. It happens when the spermatic cord, which provides blood flow to the testicle, rotates and becomes twisted. The twisting cuts off the testicle's blood supply and causes sudden pain and swelling. Testicular torsion requires immediate surgery to save the testicle. If testicle torsion goes on for more than a few hours, it may permanently damage the testicle, and a damaged testicle must be removed. The amount of twisting can be anywhere from 180 to 720 degrees. The degree of twisting affects how quickly a testicle gets damaged. As a general rule, within about 4 to 6 hours, the testicle can be saved about 90% of the time. After 12 hours, this drops to 50%, and after 24 hours, the testicle can only be saved about 10% of the time. Most cases of testicular torsion affect guys who have a condition called bell clapper deformity. In most males, the testicles are attached to the scrotum, making it hard for them to twist. In males who have bell clapper deformity, the testicles are unsecured and can move and twist in the scrotum. Torsion predominantly affects the left testicle, as it most commonly hangs slightly lower than the right. Testicular torsion can happen to boys and men of any age, but is most common in 12 to 18-year-old boys. It can happen after strenuous exercise, while someone is sleeping, or after an injury to the scrotum. A lot of times, though, there is no apparent cause for this condition. If an individual is suffering from testicular torsion, chances are they're going to know something significantly is wrong. They will feel a sudden and possible severe pain in their scrotum and one of the testicles. The pain may increase and decrease, but generally does not go away completely. 
Other symptoms include swelling, especially on one side of the scrotum, nausea and vomiting, belly pain, and one testicle will appear to be higher than the other. A hydrocele is a type of swelling in the scrotum that occurs when fluid collects in the thin sheath surrounding the testicle. A hydrocele is common in newborns and usually disappears without treatment by age one. Older boys and adult men can develop a hydrocele due to inflammation or injury within the scrotum. A hydrocele usually is not painful or harmful and may not need any treatment. But if an individual has scrotal swelling, they need to see their doctor to rule out other causes. Usually, the only indication of a hydrocele is painless swelling on one or both testicles. Adult men with a hydrocele might experience discomfort from the heaviness of a swollen scrotum. Pain generally increases with the size of the inflammation. Sometimes the swollen area might be smaller in the morning and larger later in the day. It is estimated that approximately 6% of adult males have a clinically apparent hydrocele. This can cause scrotal aching or painful scrotal swelling. A varicocele is an enlargement of the veins within the loose bag of skin that holds the testicles. A varicocele is similar to varicose veins that you may see in a leg. Varicoceles are a common cause of low sperm production and decreased sperm quality, which causes infertility. However, not all varicoceles affect sperm production. Varicoceles can also cause testicles to fail to develop normally or to even shrink. Most varicoceles develop over time. Fortunately, they are easy to diagnose and most do not need treatment. If a varicocele does cause symptoms, it often can be repaired surgically. This occurs in approximately 20% of the adult male population and is described as feeling like a bag of worms underneath the skin. A varicocele often produces no signs or symptoms, but rarely might cause pain. The pain can vary from sharp to dull discomfort. It may increase while standing or physical exertion, especially over long periods of time. This could also worsen over the course of the day. This pain can be relieved by having the patient lie on their back. This condition almost always occurs on the left side. Testicular cancer occurs in the testicles or testes, which are located inside of the scrotum. Compared with other types of cancer, testicular cancer is relatively rare. Although it can affect a man or a boy at any age, it is most often found in men aged 15 to 44 years. It is fairly rare and very treatable. With early diagnosis, testicular cancer can be cured. With treatment, the relative risk of death from cancer is very small. To catch this cancer early, men are encouraged to learn about early signs, learn how to do a testicular self-exam, and talk with their healthcare provider if there is a suspicious lump, swelling, or pain in the area. The most common sign is a painless lump in the testicle swelling of the testicle with or without pain, or a feeling of weight in the scrotum, pain or a dull ache in the testicle, scrotum, or groin, tenderness or change in the male breast tissue. If someone finds a lump or a firm part of their testicle, they should be encouraged to see a doctor to find out if it is a tumor. Very few men who have testicular cancer felt pain at first. Many men do not tell their healthcare provider about these signs. On average, men wait for about five months before saying anything. Prostate cancer is the most common cancer found only in men and the third most common non-skin cancer diagnosed in Americans. The American Cancer Society estimates that nearly 175,000 new cases of prostate cancer will be diagnosed in the United States in 2019. Despite increased screening and a steady decline in the number of prostate cancer deaths over the years, prostate cancer still is the second leading cause of cancer deaths among American men. About men die from the disease every year. The death rate is twice as high for African American men than from any other group. Prostate cancer is rarely diagnosed in men younger than age 40. By age 50, it is common for men to experience changes in the size and the shape of the cells within the prostate. Understanding whether these changes are signs of prostate tumor 
and knowing your risks for developing prostate cancer are important steps in protecting an individual's health. Vaginitis is an inflammation of the vagina that can result in discharge, itching, and pain. The cause is usually a change in the normal balance of vaginal bacteria or from an infection. Reduced estrogen levels after menopause and some skin disorders can also cause vaginitis. The most common types of vaginitis are bacterial vaginosis, which results from a change in the normal bacteria found in your vagina to overgrowth of other organisms, a yeast infection, which are usually caused by a natural occurring fungus called Candidia albicans, or trichomoniasis, which is caused by a parasite and is commonly transmitted by sexual intercourse. In the sexually active athlete, these three conditions account for 90% of all cases of vaginitis. Wearing thongs, especially during athletic participation, can transport bacteria from the anus, thereby introducing foreign bacteria to the vagina. Treatment depends upon the type of vaginitis you have. Pelvic inflammatory disease is an infection of the uterus, fallopian tubes, ovaries, and cervix. Untreated pelvic inflammatory disease might cause scar tissue and collections of infected fluid or abscesses to develop in your fallopian tubes and damage your reproductive organs. Pelvic inflammatory disease often causes no signs or symptoms, and as a result, the patient may not realize that they have the condition. The condition may be detected later if an individual has trouble getting pregnant or if they develop chronic pelvic pain. Signs and symptoms of pelvic inflammatory disease might include pain in the lower abdomen and pelvis, heavy vaginal discharge with an unpleasant odor, abnormal uterine bleeding, especially during or after intercourse or between menstrual cycles, fever, sometimes with chills, and painful or difficult urination. Many types of bacteria can cause PID, but gonorrhea and chlamydia infections are the most common. These bacteria are usually acquired during unprotected sex. Less commonly, bacteria can enter your reproductive tract any time the normal barrier created by the cervix is disrupted. This can happen after childbirth, miscarriage, or abortion. Dysmenorrhea is the medical term for menstrual cramps, which are caused by uterine contractions. Primary dysmenorrhea is common menstrual cramps that are recurrent, which means they come back and are not due to other diseases. The pain usually begins one to two days before or when menstrual bleeding starts and is felt in the lower abdomen, back, and even thighs. Pain can range from mild to severe and typically lasts 12 to 72 hours. It may also be accompanied by nausea and vomiting, fatigue, and even diarrhea. Common menstrual cramps usually become less painful as a woman ages and may stop entirely if the woman has a baby. Secondary dysmenorrhea is pain that is caused by a disorder in the woman's reproductive organs, such as endometriosis, adenomyosis, uterine fibroids, or an infection. Pain from secondary dysmenorrhea usually begins earlier in the menstrual cycle and lasts longer than common menstrual cramps. The pain is not typically accompanied by nausea, vomiting, fatigue, or diarrhea. Menstrual cramps are caused by contractions in the uterus by a chemical called prostaglandin. The uterus contracts throughout a woman's menstrual cycle. During menstruation, the uterus contracts more strongly. If the uterus contracts too strongly, it can press against nearby blood vessels cutting off the supply of oxygen to the muscle tissue of the uterus. Pain results when part of the muscle briefly loses its supply of oxygen. Amenorrhea is an absence of a menstruation, one or more missed menstrual periods. Women who have missed at least three menstrual periods in a row have amenorrhea, as do girls who have not begun menstruation by age 15. The most common cause of amenorrhea is pregnancy. Other causes of amenorrhea include problems with the reproductive organs or with the glands that help regulate hormone levels. Treatment of the underlying condition often resolves the amenorrhea. Some women who take birth control pills may not have periods. Even after stopping oral contraceptives, it may take some time before regular ovulation and menstruation return. 
Contraceptives that are injected or implanted may also cause amenorrhea, as can some types of intrauterine devices. Some lifestyle factors may also contribute to amenorrhea, for instance, low body weight, excessive exercise, and stress. Ovarian cancer is a type of cancer that begins in the ovaries. The female reproductive system contains two ovaries, one on each side of the uterus. The ovaries, each about the size of an almond, produce eggs, or ova, as well as the hormones estrogen and progesterone. Ovarian cancer often goes undetected until it is spread within the pelvis and the abdomen. At this late stage, ovarian cancer is more difficult to treat. Early stage ovarian cancer, in which the disease is confined to the ovary, is more likely to be treated successfully. Surgery and chemotherapy are generally used to treat ovarian cancer. Early stage ovarian cancer rarely causes any symptoms. Advanced stage ovarian cancer may cause few and nonspecific symptoms that are often mistaken for more common benign conditions. The signs and symptoms of ovarian cancer may include abdominal bloating or swelling, quickly feeling full when eating, weight loss, discomfort in the pelvic area, changes in bowel habits such as constipation, and a frequent need to urinate. Cervical cancer is a type of cancer that occurs in the cells of the cervix, or the lower part of the uterus that connects to the vagina. Various strains of the human papillomavirus, a sexually transmitted infection, play a role in cancers. When exposed to HPV, the body's immune system typically prevents the virus from doing harm. In a small percentage of people, however, the virus survives for years, contributing to the process that causes some cervical cells to become cancer cells. Mm. Early stage cervical cancer generally produces no signs or symptoms. Signs and symptoms of more advanced cervical cancer include vaginal bleeding after intercourse, between periods, or after menopause, watery, bloody vaginal discharge that may be heavy or have a foul odor, and pelvic pain or pain during intercourse. Breast cancer is a cancer that forms in the cells of the breast. After skin cancer, breast cancer is the most common cancer diagnosed in women in the United States. Breast cancer can occur in both men and women, but is far more common in women. Breast cancer survival rates have increased and the number of deaths associated with this disease is steadily declining, largely due to factors such as earlier detection, a new personalized approach to treatment, and better understanding of the disease. Signs and symptoms of breast cancer may include a breast lump or thickening that feels different from the surrounding tissue, changes in the size, shape, and appearance of the breast, changes to the skin over the breast such as dimpling, or a newly inverted nipple. An individual may also see peeling, scaling, crusting, or flaking of the pigmented area of the skin surrounding the nipple or breast skin, redness or pitting of the skin over the breast like the skin of an orange. Doctors estimate that about 5 to 10% of breast cancers are linked to gene mutations passed down through generations of a family. An ectopic pregnancy occurs when a fertilized egg implants and grows outside of the main cavity of the uterus. Pregnancy begins with a fertilized egg. Normally, the fertilized egg attaches to the lining of the uterus. An ectopic pregnancy often occurs in the fallopian tube, which carries the egg from the ovaries to the uterus. This type of ectopic pregnancy is called a tubal pregnancy. Sometimes an ectopic pregnancy occurs in other areas of the body, such as the ovary, abdominal cavity, or the lower part of the uterus or cervix, which connects to the vagina. An ectopic pregnancy cannot proceed normally. The fertilized egg will not survive, and the growing tissue may cause life-threatening bleeding if left untreated. An individual may not notice anything at first, However, some women with an ectopic pregnancy have the usual early signs or symptoms of pregnancy, including a missed menstrual cycle, breast tenderness, and nausea. If an individual takes a pregnancy test, the results will likely be positive. Still, the ectopic pregnancy cannot continue as normal. The signs and symptoms increase as the fertilized egg grows in the improper place. Often, the first warning sign of an ectopic pregnancy is pelvic pain. Light vaginal bleeding may also occur. If the fertilized egg continues to grow in the fallopian tube, it can cause the tube to rupture. 
heavy bleeding inside the abdomen is likely. Symptoms of this life-threatening event include extreme lightheadedness, fainting, severe abdominal pain, and even shock. 